When Russia invaded Ukraine, pretty much everything changed overnight instantly. Russia went from a slight adversary to the West to an outright enemy overnight, and no one who values human life at all was happy to see that invasion happen. The mood was rather glum. Prospects for Ukraine also looked rather poor because most people thought the war was pretty much just a foregone conclusion. Incredibly though, Ukraine defied all odds and they stopped the Russian advance at Kyiv, at Sumy, at Chernihiv, at Kharkiv and a bunch of other places too. They did lose lots of ground in the south around Kherson and the Donbass in particular but in the end they stabilised that line too. In short, they shocked the world and they shocked myself as well. Many people claimed that the war was still over though, that Ukraine still had no chance, that they should lay down their arms and stop the bloodshed, but I really wasn't so sure after this first development. Ukraine had proven its abilities, although I remained cautiously optimistic. Of course, many viewers of this channel said I was just overtly wrong and that Russia was once again about to win the war. Now, to be clear, I was wrong, just not in the way that people thought. I thought the war would enter a phase of strategic stalemate with little ground to be gained by either side and at great cost of life as well. The last week though that has been thrown entirely out of the window as Ukraine launched a second counter-offensive in the east of Ukraine near the Donbass region and the success has been absolutely remarkable. It seems that the tide of war has finally shifted and Ukraine is now on the front foot with Russia scrambling behind. Today we'll look at exactly what happened then, what's happening now and what might happen next. But before we can get started, I want to just talk briefly about sources and that we can broadly look at two different types of sources. Those that gather intelligence from the states, from private sources or individuals and organisations that gather intelligence from open sources. Now looking at what the British Ministry of Defence has to say can be very valuable and the same is to be said for the Russian armed forces, the American and the Ukrainian armed forces too but we don't get to see all of the intelligence that they're basing this information off. Their data is obviously private and of course we find ourselves at risk of biases for strategic reasons. The best example of this obviously being Russia lying about the causes of explosions in airfields and weapons depot that have happened over the last few months. That's a perfect example. Now open source intelligence though can be verified by anyone, you or me included. We get videos and photos and satellite imagery, radio transmissions and it's all freely available online. Certain aggregators find this information, they geolocate it, they date it and they use it to build a picture of a war and that is mostly what I'll be looking at when looking at this war as it's the most verifiable and it comes from neutral observers as well as supporters of both sides. This is the best way to gather a full picture of the war for sure. Some examples of people and accounts and organizations that document this stuff is this Twitter account OSINT uh, Technical, we have OSINT Defender as well, and then we have Oryx who is probably the gold standard when it comes to material losses for both sides here. The best and most comprehensive and accurate aggregator of all this information though is the Institute for the Study of War who uh, nearly every day publish a full update into the goings on of this war in Ukraine. Now they use entirely OSIN, open source intelligence, and they list every single piece of intelligence that they've used over the last day, which usually amounts to about 50 pieces of evidence for each publication. Now I've seen many people claim that this organization is incredibly biased in my comments, but no one has ever given me any evidence to support this assertion that they're biased. And until such time as these accusers actually prove some inaccuracies from this organization, it is the best source we have to go on. Now regarding the war, first we had that stalemate that seemed to be setting in. Russia had made massive advancements into Ukraine in the first month, but then cracks started to show. They withdrew from Kyiv and the north and they held onto their ground in the south and the east. Both sides started to build up their forces, but no major assaults really went forward for months. Ukraine did seem to just about be getting the better of Russia. They were destroying airfields, ammo depots and bridges, stuff like that, but nothing too major. This though, you can see me behind me here, is a map of the situation of the war in Ukraine as of the May of 20th. And this map behind me that you can see now is the exact same situation as of August the 20th, three months apart with virtually no change whatsoever. And that's why a lot of people, myself included, were referring to the war at this point as a stalemate. Yes, there were missile strikes and some partisan warfare going on on either side, but no major ground changes were made. 
In late August though, Ukraine launched a pretty major counteroffensive around Kherson and it had been building up for a while and this build up was heavily documented and reported on as well. Frankly, everyone knew this offensive was coming, Russia knew it was coming and they were preparing for it for months as well as Ukraine. Now for the first few days, the ground grained was relatively small and it came at some very fierce fighting. The Russian line was holding on and Ukrainian forces were taking a fair amount of casualties and this again furthered that idea of the war being a phase of stalemate as this was a major offensive that took months to plan and organize. It came with no decisive breakthrough or massive engagements though. But things have started to change regarding this Kherson offensive. Uh, it started about two weeks ago now and ground has been a steady gain for the Ukrainian forces, albeit if a little slow. This map here behind me shows the ground gained by Ukrainian forces over the last two weeks. They are slowly but steadily making their ways towards the Dnieper River and the city of Kherson. Russian logistics are strained and a bunch of bridges across the river that supplied Russian forces have now been destroyed. Russia has been trying to use pontoon bridges, ferries and airlift capabilities to keep their forces supplied but they have been notably struggling and there are many reports out there of lacking supplies for Russian units and the ground is still steadily being lost by Russia each day. As of the situation for Kherson right now, there are early reports that maybe Russian forces have done a large withdrawal overnight, but this is all unconfirmed and I don't really want to speculate on this because right now we just don't know. This result though was kind of acceptable to Russia. There were small amounts of ground loss, there was no major disintegration of Russian forces and there were potentially very heavy losses on the Ukrainian side. The problem with this though becomes clear over the last week only because this assault on the Kherson front was in the end not the main assault by Ukraine and observers like you and I and Russian forces in particular were tricked by Ukraine. On the 6th of September after about a week of major fighting on the Kherson front, Ukrainian forces then launched a large assault around Kharkiv in the east near the Donbass. Success for Ukrainian forces here was nearly instant with Russian forces not really expecting any kind of assault here. Many of the troops that were guarding this area in the past had been pulled away from the east and sent further west as Russia thought that was where the fighting was going to be. You can see from this map behind me here that the gains have been pretty massive. About 3,000 square kilometers of ground has been regained by Ukrainian forces including some major population and logistical centers like Izium. There has been land that was taken by Russian separatists as far back as 2014 that's now only recently been liberated by Ukrainian forces. After about three days of this offensive, Ukraine had pushed some 15 miles uh, through the front line in some places and now it's been pushed some 45 miles back in some places too. Reports are now widespread of Russian forces collapsing in the area with command and logistics completely falling apart and these reports are likely accurate as Ukrainian forces are gaining ground ridiculously quickly here with minimal casualties. They have in many locations pushed the Russians back to the original border with no resistance at that border either and Ukrainian forces making a conscious decision not to invade Russia itself. This really came out of nowhere from our point of view. Ukraine did a brilliant job of uh, directing attention to Kherson and Russia, plain and simple, fell for it. They withdrew their troops and created a weakness for the Ukrainian forces to exploit. The Institute for the Study of War's analysis of this event is as follows. Ukrainian forces have inflicted a major operational defeat on Russia, recapturing almost all of Kharkiv Oblast in a rapid counteroffensive. The Ukrainian success resulted from skillful campaign design and execution that included efforts to maximize the impact of Western weapons such as HIMARS. Kyiv's long discussion and then announcement of a counteroffensive operation aimed at Kherson Oblast drew substantial Russian troops away from the sectors on which Russian forces have conducted decisive attacks in the past several days. Ukraine's armed forces employed HIMARS and other Western systems to attack Russian ground lines of communications in Kharkiv and Kherson Oblast, setting conditions for the success of this operation. Ukrainian leaders discussed the strikes in the south much more ostentatiously, however successfully confusing the Russians about their intentions in Kharkiv Oblast. Western weapon systems were necessary but not sufficient to secure success for Ukraine. The Ukrainian employment of those systems in a well-designed and well-executed campaign has generated the remarkable success of the counter-offensive operations in Kharkiv Oblast. The Institute for the Study of War also seems to think that Russia's stated objectives are once more unachievable in light of this breakthrough. The Ukrainian recapture of Izium ended the prospect that Russia could accomplish its stated objectives in Donetsk Oblast. After retreating from Kyiv in early April, the stated Russian objectives 
had been to seize the complete territory of Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast. The Russian campaign to achieve these objectives was an attack along an arc from Izium through Severodonetsk in the area near Donetsk City. The loss of Izium dooms the initial Russian campaign plan for this phase of the war and ensures that Russian advances towards Bakhmut and around Donetsk City cannot be decisive if they even occur at all. Now in fairness, some people are claiming that this uh, advance by Ukraine is actually some kind of genius pincer move by Russian forces intending to let Ukrainian forces break through so the Russians can then cut them off and destroy the offensive altogether. To be clear though, it is possible that this is the case technically, but there's no evidence whatsoever to suggest that it's actually true and this pincer move, if it is planned by Russia, has so far yet to materialize at all. What is next for the war then? Well, it's actually very hard to say here and I'm very cautious of making outright predictions because I've been wrong about pretty much everything so far, funnily enough. People watching this video will probably say then, ah, so you've admit you were wrong before, you're probably wrong here again. And that is a fair point, but I've been wrong time and time again by overestimating the Russians, not the Ukrainians. At the outbreak of the war, I thought maybe one or two weeks of fighting before major cities uh, would fall to Russia and the Kyiv government would flee the country and Russia would occupy Ukraine as a whole. I was wrong there by massively overstating Russia and underestimating Ukraine. Then I was wrong about Russia's control of the Black Sea. I thought they'd be able to hold it and utilize it really easily. And the Navy may even try some naval launches towards population centers like Odessa, but I was wrong again. Russia lost their Black Sea fleet uh, flagship. They lost a bunch of other ships as well, and they now can't really utilize the Black Sea at all. Then I thought the war would settle into a stalemate and would see no major advances from either side. But again, Ukraine just proved me wrong. They've made huge gains across the Eastern Front and some significant gains across the Kherson Front as well. Every mistake I've made here has really been underestimating the Ukrainians and overestimating the Russians. So I'm cautious not to do it again. But I think it's a little bit unlikely that I end up being outright wrong in the other direction. We are also getting some very weird sorts of information out from Russia itself. Uh, behind me here is a, a Russian panel show type thing uh, looking at the war in Ukraine with subtitles underneath for obvious reasons. Now at the start of this war, this kind of stuff was insanely positive. Russia was perfect, their army was invincible and Putin was God. Now we find that certain people starting to say things against those ideas and I'll post a full video in the comments down below for anyone who wants to look at this but it is six minutes long. In short though one man says that we're all thinking it's going to plan but this is Russian propaganda and not true. If anyone said that six months ago this was the plan then they would have been called insane. Another came out and said that Putin was likely led astray by his advisors who caused him to pursue this plan that has now failed. They discuss lies about the support from Ukrainian civilians. There was this line of Russian soldiers only being at risk of being hugged too tightly when they liberate cities like Odessa. And these analysts on this Russian state media panel show point out how incredibly wrong that analysis was. The reason I bring this up is that this is literal Russian state propaganda. These people are allowed to go on this show because of their positions of power and their support of Putin in the past. They are wealthy because of the power given to them by Putin and other oligarchs and even they are starting to turn against the war and almost turn against Putin as well. This really does not bode well for the current power structures in Russia and it also makes it clear that actually the war is not going according to plan at all, even from the perspective of the most hardline supporters of Putin's regime. Now there are plenty of rumors to go around surrounding this as well. There are rumors of a coup against Putin that's planned. Over the weekend we saw central Moscow blocked off and no one was allowed in or out and there was plenty of speculation regarding that as well that maybe something happened inside. This is though all speculation. I've seen no evidence whatsoever showing that Putin is actually fighting a coup. There's no evidence that one is actually planned. Yes, people in Russia do seem to be unhappy with this failing war, but to draw huge conclusions from that alone does not make any sense in my opinion. So I'd like to stick to what we actually know.